So let me start with a little story. In another metropolitan region, the head of one of the local development agencies has a shtick with visiting politicians and dignitaries. He invites them to do a mini interview, and what visitor can say no? And then once they're on camera and on the record, he asks, please tell us why our region is such an example to the rest of Canada. Now, as a public relations tactic, it's somewhere between brazen and bizarre. But no polite Canadian is going to walk away or even just say, sorry, you have delusions of grandeur. <laughs> what gets said, of course, are very positive things. And once that effusive praise is on the record, it can be used by the region. Moreover, having said it on the record, the visitor has to keep saying it in the interest of consistency. Well, in Toronto, I suspect someone in the same role would get a visitor on camera and ask them to expound on everything that's wrong with the region. <laughs> you know, these days with the blackly humorous dramas at City Hall and the endless angst about how we're losing our mojo, Toronto sometimes feels like the Woody Allen of global alpha cities. <laughs> it's time to get over ourselves. Yes, there are things to fix, but let us take some time to celebrate the hugely positive features of the remarkable municipalities and areas that together make up the Toronto metropolitan region. Now, let me put up a couple of slides with various international and later national rankings for the Toronto metropolitan region. I won't read them to you. I'll leave them on screen as we keep going here. And just let me point out that new Torontonians do notice our regional neurosis. Many here will recall a couple of years ago in a great speech to this board, Frank McKenna observed that Toronto needed to get its swagger back. And Mr. McKenna added, it's not enough to have the steak, you also have to have the sizzle. Well, let me continue today uh, with a modified cooking metaphor. What makes the Toronto metropolitan region so great is that we offer a multi-course, multicultural banquet with world-class cuisine. That's the sizzle. That's certainly part of the story of Toronto's success. And yet somehow, we seem to be reluctant to sharpen that great storyline and to tell it. So much of what I'd like to do today is just that, frame a provisional narrative for the Toronto region. Now, according to common political lore, Toronto is a financial and health services hub. Yep, that much is true. It's the third largest financial center and fourth largest health sciences community in North America. We also have the third largest biotech cluster in North America and more than half of Canada's pharmaceutical companies and a lot of related biomedical industrial activity. But this is only part of a larger and more complex story. And that's a challenge for us because the media and politicians like simple stories. Now, it's a paradoxical challenge because when you look at our rank in Canada, you see that the Toronto region's outsized clout reflects truly multi-sectoral strength. And if you'll permit a short pointy-headed aside, this strength doesn't simply add up. It's multiplicative. More and more innovation worldwide is driven by cross-sectoral convergence. And that means we have positive feedback loops, a snowballing effect. That's how conversion works in all the key urban regions that are so prominent on the world stage. So let me give you three examples. The Toronto metropolitan region's food and beverage sector is the largest in Canada with the second largest food production and processing center in North America behind only Los Angeles. That unassuming Ontario food terminal you can pass on the Gardner Expressway or the Queensway is the largest wholesale fruit, vegetable, and flower market in Canada and one of the five biggest in North America. Nearly 60,000 people work in over 1,500 distinct businesses in that sector here in the region. It's a perfect example of multiplicative convergence. Not high tech, not glamorous, but hugely important. 
The food and beverage industry depends on its success for strength in a host of other sectors and generates growth in them as well. It relies on and contributes to strengths in nutritional science, biotechnology, manufacturing, materials, packaging, design, storage and logistics. All areas in which Toronto is Canada's leader. Let's go to the design sector. Nearly a third of Canada's design workforce, more than 28,000 designers, hail from the Toronto metropolitan region. Together they comprise the third largest design sector in North America behind only New York and Boston. Nearly three quarters of Ontario's architects, landscape architects, industrial, graphic and interior designers are located right here in the region. And again, this depends on convergence. In fact, it depends on strengths in information and communications technology, or ICT, marketing and advertising, product development, the creative and cultural industries, and of course, some very sophisticated talent. And again, it's a flywheel. Success in the design sector drives success in so many other areas. A third and, and final example, Toronto in general is in fact Canada's high tech hub. Aerospace, pharma, advanced materials, ICT, it's all here. But digital media is a particularly strong sector. Why? Well, 30% of Canada's ICT firms and 40% of the top 250 ICT companies are headquartered in the Toronto metropolitan region. Mix in the region's strength as Canada's leading creative and cultural hub, and you can see why we are currently ranked third in digital media for North America. Ladies and gentlemen, there's another great effect of convergence because it explains why Toronto is also Canada's startup and entrepreneurial capital something that very few people realize. As of February 2012, 36% of Canada's top 100 startups have their homes in the Toronto metro region. And the OECD has concluded that Toronto has the fourth highest rate of entrepreneurship of any region in the entire OECD. No other Canadian region is close. And yes, venture capital is too thin in this country, but in the decade, between 1999 and 2009, more venture capital was invested in Toronto region than in Montreal and Vancouver combined. Now, what's driving this? Convergence is so important, but institutions can help. I'll single out one briefly with a spousal conflict of interest. <laughs> The Mars Discovery District is playing a vital role facilitating this buzzing startup and entrepreneurial activity, in part because its founders, not least the wise and wonderful John Evans, envisaged it from the beginning as a convergence factory. And yet further to that oversimplified view of Toronto that I sketched at the start, I used to hear Mars described as a real estate play focused on life sciences. Not so much anymore. Mars has helped over 2,000 startups since it's opened its doors in 2005. On the order of 850 firms are on the Mars active roster now, and only about 20% are from the life sciences and healthcare sectors. Big change. Majority are from ICT, clean tech, social purpose, materials, and advanced manufacturing. Mars is by any measure the largest, most diverse, and influential business incubator in the country and is respected worldwide. But what's great is that the Toronto metropolitan region is home to a host of incubators and accelerators. The world's first fashion incubator, the food business incubator, the Center for Social Innovation, the Mississauga Technology Business Accelerator, Venture Lab and the Markham Convergence Center, and the Digital Media Zone at Ryerson. I could go on, and here's a, a kind of Interesting footnote, at the University of Toronto and with our partner hospitals, the entrepreneurial activity has ramped up to the point that we recently repurposed most of the Banting and Best buildings, those historic sites, as incubation space. We haven't even had time to advertise it. But I suppose it's fitting somehow since Banting and Best were integral to one of this country's great innovations. As I said, startups and great ideas are blooming across the region because convergence is the lifeblood of innovation and entrepreneurship. Expertise in physics and computer science and electrical engineering comes together to drive quantum computing where we are strong. 
optics, advanced manufacturing, chemistry, and nanotech drive solar and clean tech innovation. The conjunction of finance and ICT yields e-commerce initiatives. Genetics, bioengineering, and the health sciences come together in personalized medicine. There are dozens of examples of this convergent creativity here in the region, and it's all here if we would only take time to notice and to celebrate it. In fact, it's all here might be a useful, albeit cheeky, slogan for Toronto. Put simply, we're good at everything because we're good at everything. It comes together. <laughs> now, these broad, <coughs> multi-sectoral strengths and the associated synergy and energy are ultimately what distinguish New York and London and Mumbai and Beijing and, yes, Toronto from many excellent smaller centers and clusters. So let's pause for a second to consider New York, the quintessential alpha region, right? The big dog. Financial services, healthcare, creative industries, manufacturing, you name it, they excel at it. And yet, something interesting has happened. This is Roosevelt Island, where a new campus is being created. Mayor Michael Bloomberg saw a gap in their convergence portfolio, a shortfall in applied science and engineering, and he acted on that with his Applied Science NYC initiative. Most here, I think, will already have heard that Cornell and the Technion, Israel's Institute of Technology, have won the right to build this campus on Roosevelt Island. The city's donating land and 100 million in capital to help build a facility that will bring together graduate students in applied sciences, entrepreneurs and residents, business incubators, venture capitalists, and other services for early stage enterprises. Audacious. They forecast $23 billion in economic activity over the next 30 years and some 600 spin-off companies. And that's just the first phase of applied science, New York City. I'm delighted that President Halton of the New York Poly, affiliated with New York University, is here because there is another consortium of universities led by NYU discussing a second phase with the city, a new center for urban science and progress that will focus information technology and engineering firepower on the unique challenges of big cities. Now, I'm a huge fan of Mayor Bloomberg and his vision, but in one respect, we're already better positioned than New York. We've got applied science pretty well covered as you can see at a glance from these peer review rankings worldwide. And furthermore, the University of Toronto is delighted to be exporting some of our expertise to New York as a partner with President Holton and others, including Carnegie Mellon and the University of Warwick and IIT Bombay and the Center for Urban Science and Progress in the Big Apple. Well, that's a good segue for me to comment briefly, very briefly, on post-secondary education in the region. We are so fortunate to have 10 universities and community colleges, many on multiple sites scattered throughout the region that help move the talent agenda forward. York University to the north, at Southern Glendon campus, or Ryerson and OCAD right here in the city center. The University of Ontario Institute of Technology in Durham, growing, and then spread throughout the region widely the five best community colleges in Canada, Centennial, George Brown, Seneca, Humber, and Sheridan. Convergence again. This time in a set of extremely strong educational institutions with distinctive and highly complementary strengths. As I said, it's all here. Let's shift gears now and spend just a few minutes offering up some ideas, if I might, about how we could amplify the Toronto narrative, build on our success. So first of four points, let's do some geography. What region exactly are we talking about? Well, here's the map. Everything I have said so far, all those great regional performance statistics, refer to this census metropolitan area. Just as convergence amplifies the multi-sectoral strength of the region, each municipality in the region brings unique assets to the table. The happy reality of this region isn't, is that it is not a continuous conurbation, endless urban sprawl, 
there's breathing room. A remarkable mix of densities and geographies. The green space, a huge asset, whether it's the rolling hills of Calendon or the headwaters region, or the 220 meters of managed trails on acres of protected green space up in Uxbridge, I could go on. The slides are stunning. But we've also got an extraordinary range of great urban settings, Brampton and Oakville to the west, or Richmond Hill and Newmarket to the north, Pickering to the east. The region even includes the Holland Marsh, Canada's very own salad bowl. And after you've had your salad, you can enjoy the strengths and attractions of downtown Toronto, go to one of the world's great opera houses, or perhaps like me tonight, you can go cheer for the Raptors, or if you prefer, you can go tomorrow night and pray for the Maple Leafs. <laughs> In short, the diversity of communities and places is astonishing. And just imagine how much better it would be if we had a transit system that really allowed us to get from one part to the other and enjoy it. We're also blessed with some very strong and unique municipal leaders. Mayor McCallion in Mississauga and Mayor Scarpitti in Markham, for example, two individuals I've gotten to know a bit stellar in very different ways, both effective champions for their cities and driving an active innovation agenda. And let me use that as a jumping off point to acknowledge that yes, there are municipal rivalries. But like it or not, the diverse municipalities in this region, including the great city of Toronto, are codependent. And like it or not, in the boardrooms of China, India, Brazil, and dozens of other countries, Markham and Mississauga shine not just on their own, but because they are unique destinations in the Toronto region. I'd suggest, sir, therefore, that we abandon these vague references to the GTA, whatever that is. Let's use the census metropolitan area and talk about the Toronto metropolitan region. And let me also suggest that we stop overstretching that region to include adjacent metropolitan areas. Yes, there's lots of traffic and collaboration with the Hamilton and Waterloo regions. Yes, lots of people stream out of Metro Toronto to Muskoka or the Kawarthas. All these boundaries are completely porous and necessarily arbitrary. But you know, without some boundaries and some effort to create a common narrative inside those boundaries, there's not even a team of friendly rivals. There's just incoherence. Second of four points, we really have to dedicate ourselves to international partnerships, academic, business, civil, political, especially in East and South Asia. This is part of a modern Copernican revolution, away from the zero-sum game of brain drain versus brain gain, and into the new world of brain chains, interlocking jurisdictions that are stronger together. And yes, we hear that more immigrants are going west these days. Well, given the current transit situation and the talent still pouring into the region, I'm actually not losing sleep about that shift. The Toronto metropolitan region is still the nation's immigration gateway and magnet with over 40% of all new Canadian immigrants settling here. And more importantly, as you can see on any university or college campus, and this is a basketball game, uh, at uh, U of T, we have an amazing cultural kaleidoscope. The largest foreign-born population of any region in the world, a region where East meets West and bridges to the Global South can be so readily and appropriately built. We could not be better positioned to prosper from a globalizing economy. It's multiplicative convergence again, this time in terms of populations, cultures, and perspectives. Third, if we could ever agree on boundaries and a narrative, perhaps we might get more of our fair share of tax dollars back into the region. You know, I grew up in Woodstock when it was called the dairy capital of Canada. 
And it's a central principle of animal husbandry that you don't starve your cash cow, especially in tough times. Every time I hear someone talking about Ontario the profligate, where our province stands in for Greece and the city of Toronto stands in for Athens, I have to contain an irate rejoinder. In fact, I get an attack of the red mist. The facts, once again, are rather different than the soundbite. Ontario spends less per person than any other province, 2,000 odd dollars less per person than the average of the other nine provinces. Meanwhile, as the Drummond Report clearly showed, we continue to subsidize many other parts of Canada to the tune of about $12.3 billion net per annum. And yes, that's net of so-called equalization payments that we receive and after the current government in Ottawa has taken some very commendable steps to improve things for us. Almost six billion of the 12.3 billion comes from the Toronto region. Can you imagine how different this region would be if we got even half of those dollars back into play each year? And while I'm at it, someone should do the same math for Queen's Park. Credit where it's due. The current Ontario government has done some great things for the Toronto region. Nevertheless, I have a little suspicion that even as successive Ontario governments have complained about redistribution by Ottawa, they've been doing a good job of redistributing tax dollars from the Toronto region to every other region in this province. Now, three important caveats. We can't prosper long term only by repatriating more of our existing tax dollars. That's clear. We can't get wealthy by counting other people's money. And we should be net contributors to this great province and this great country, given all the advantages our region has. But we make it far too easy for Ottawa and Queen's Park to starve their cash cow by not presenting a coherent narrative that underscores the economic importance of our region. On that point, ladies and gentlemen, Toronto's gross metropolitan product represents 45% of Ontario's GDP and 20% of Canada's GDP. Estimates vary, but even at the conservative end, the Toronto metropolitan region contributes more to Canada's GDP than New York, Chicago, and Boston contribute to the US GDP combined. According to less conservative estimates, you could actually throw in LA to that threesome to match what we do for Canada. If the Toronto metropolitan region were a country, it would have a larger GDP than Finland or Denmark or Hungary or Israel. So make no mistake, as the Toronto metropolitan region goes, so goes Canada. Fourth, let me say it again. Can we get on with fixing our transportation challenges? I'll bet that even those here who disagree with yesterday's vote by the Toronto City Council are somewhat relieved that we are now at least less likely to leave $8 billion on the table. The congestion, as the Toronto Board of Trade has reminded us in one report after another compellingly, takes a huge toll. Annual costs for commuters have been estimated at $3.3 billion with an annual economic drag on the region of 2.7 billion. And those are estimates from 2006, which for those of you like me who drive too much, seems like the good old days on the highways of the Toronto region. Average round trip commuting time in Toronto is 80 minutes, the worst of all the cities that T-Bot has scored. Imagine instead if we had Taiwan's high speed rail line. I was on it very recently. It shuttles people at 300 kilometers per hour Kan covers the length of the island from Taipei to Kaohsiung in 96 minutes. That's the distance from Niagara Falls to Kingston. Try covering that in 96 minutes on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> so knitting the Toronto region together effectively and efficiently with better transportation will change the dynamic among municipalities. It will promote synergy, distribute expertise and talent, promote innovation and greatly improve the quality of life for the region's population and nothing, I mean nothing, will improve the economic prospects for Ontario like investing in transportation for the Toronto metropolitan region. Let me close where I started. Somehow, 
we seem to be reluctant in this region to sharpen our great storyline and to tell it. Maybe we are a little bit like Woody Allen's movie persona, too neurotically self-critical. In fact, in planning this speech, Carol Wilding's terrific team was back and forth with my office and me, with everyone looking at how I might diagnose more problems and offer more prescriptions. Well, I'm a professor of medicine in a past life when I was more useful. <laughs> but I'll offer a psychiatric diagnosis and make it a self-diagnosis too. How about chronic hypochondriasis, a fixation on illness? Maybe that's the diagnosis. Yes, there are things to treat, but on balance, the Toronto region could scarcely be in a more brilliant position to thrive for decades. And with that diagnosis, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps we can think of today as group therapy. <laughs> perhaps we can agree on our narrative and start sharing it relentlessly. We need to do that because it will help us continue to excel, and we should do it not just for ourselves, but because the story of the Toronto metropolitan region is Canada's most important success story. Long after we've stopped profiting from selling potash and petrochemicals, and long after the current austerity measures and political squabbles and global economic upheavals, the dynamic diversity of the people and places of the Toronto region, our convergent innovation across economic sectors within and beyond the region, and the entrepreneurial energy unlocked by our creative confluence of cultures will continue to be Canada's single greatest asset. Thank you very much.